we will be given data in this case imagine that we're given x y data points like I don't know 3.2 1 2.6 0 uh, 6.8 1 minus 2.3 one and instead of being like linear regression where the y's are real numbers the x's are real numbers now the y's are binary zero one they might indicate um, the, the number on the left the input x might be a person's um, height minus something else and then the y is whether that person will pass the test or not or some other variable um, so x is there's no uncertainty in x x is given y is the variable over which we will have a distribution y is the variable that is stochastic here y hat the hat means it's important. Y hat it will be the prediction of Y. Um, now, if we have data that looks like the Y's, 0, 1 data, that's essentially the same as the data of tossing a coin and seeing whether it's heads or tails. So the right distribution to model 0, 1 data is the Bernoulli distribution. But now the success probability of the coin depends on the axis. And this is where it gets interesting. So if I want to model my y's, I assume that all the coin flips are independent, so I take a product from 1 to n. And each y is just a Bernoulli distribution with success probability pi i. So after there we haven't done anything new, it's just, it's just coin flips. But now what we're saying is that pi i is itself parametrized and essentially what we're doing is we're doing a linear regression we start with x we fit the line x times theta that's essentially the equation um, that we have here that's the equation of a plane and then we squash it through a sigmoid function and the reason why we squash it through a sigmoid function is because we know that this function here is between 0 and 1. So we get a probability. So it's a trick that allows us to get a probability, be able to interpret pi as a valid probability. It's a number between 0 and 1. And then 1 minus pi is a number between 0 and 1. Okay. So there's two things here. One is you define a probability on the y's. The distribution is over the y's and then compositionality where the success probability of the y's by i is the function of the input and that's how we start introducing probabilistic models for more complex um, for more complex settings uh, as we go into neural networks I'm going to repeat the same treatment here but just for different cases when you have binary data when the y's are Gaussian and then when the y's have multiple categories so each of those cases is things that we've seen before in the linear model we saw the Gaussian case uh, we also saw the multi-category case when in, in the treatment of naive Bayes but now we will do the tr all those different noise um, distributions uh, for models of this form where you have an input and an output and to get from the input to the output there is some sort of uh, compos compositionality okay so pi i is the success probability and so pi i is indeed the probability of y being equal to 1 when you observe x i assuming that you have parameters theta and we will learn theta the nice thing about this is that theta is a continuous variable between minus infinity and infinity it's completely unconstrained but pi i will naturally be constrained to be between 0 and 1 so we don't need to introduce funky constraints that require that the pi i is sum to 1 and 
itself. Uh, so we simply use this parameterization that will ensure that we get probabilities. Now, once we have a likelihood, how do we find what theta is? What would be a procedure for finding theta? Minimum. Maximum likelihood, I think. Guys, probably embarrasses. Too easy a question. Um, the usual procedure: you have a likelihood, take the log, differentiate, equate to zero, and so on. Only one difficulty in this case: when you differentiate and equate to zero, you're not going to be able to solve for a closed form for theta. If you do, let me know because <laughs> <laughs> that'll make a good paper. Um, before I tell you what gradients we actually get, and the, the other thing is, uh, remember from last class that um, this function here, 1 over 1 plus e to the minus xi theta, is a sigmoid function. And the sigmoid function had uh, these important properties between 0 and 1. So you can interpret it as a probability distribution. Um, it also has nice properties in terms of its derivatives, which you will find out about very soon. And then, in, you know, of course, that's in 1D. In 2D, the sigmoid function will look um, like the surface um, that I'm showing here on the right-hand side. And then what we're going to do is we're going to threshold. So we threshold this function at, say, a half, when the height is a half. And then everything to one side of half, greater than a half, is considered to be of the class 1. And everything to the other side is considered a big class 0. So effectively, we now have a classifier. Whenever you have a new x, you compute what's the probability that x, that y is equal to 1 for that x. If that's greater than 0 0.5, you assign it to one class. And if it's 0, if it's less than 0 0.5, you assign it to the other class. Okay, so once we estimate, once we can estimate this curve here, we just threshold at 0 0.5, uh, which is the same as thresholding the plane at 0. And that gives us a way of separating the y equal 1 from the y equal 0 data. But we do more than just saying that it's one or the other. We actually estimate the probability of it being one. So we're actually doing a little bit more. OK, so when we differentiate this and equate to 0, we get the following expressions for the gradient and the Hessian. Now, I'm not going to do these here in class. I'm going to ask you to do these in your next homework. Because I think at this stage, what's more valuable is for you to practice how to do this. Um, what we find out is that the gradient is given by this expression here in the box. And it sort of makes sense because it's basically comparing y. And again, the y's are the data. These are the y's between uh, 0 and 1. So either 0 or 1, sorry. And then the pi is a variable between 0 and 1. They're the predictions. And so what we're doing is we're comparing the prediction against the actual data. If your predictions are different than the actual data, your gradient of data is big, right? Because basically, if your predictions don't match the data, you should learn and learn in big steps. Whereas if your predictions agree with the data, then your, your update is small. There's no reason to, because you can actually understand what the data is. Um, we could implement gradient ascent, but it's also possible to then go and uh, compute the Hessian. Um, in this case, for logistic regression, it's very easy to get the Hessian. Um, you will get this as an exercise as well. And once, uh, once you have the Hessian, which looks at the curvature, the second derivative, and as you can see, also somewhat related to the entropy, um, 
to the vari variance of the predictions, then you, um, you'll be able to implement Newton's method. Okay, so essentially Newton's method required the Hessian and G, and once you have those, then it's very easy to apply Newton's method. And that's how we usually um, solve logistic regression. We just try Newton's method. Um, one can show, this is something that I didn't do in the linear algebra revision, so just take it as an advanced topic. If you've done enough linear algebra, you understand what this means. But the Hessian is positive definite, which um, in the multivariate case can be just interpreted as it has positive curvature. Um, that uh, major, uh, having a positive uh, definite Hessian with all positive eigenvalues means that you have a ball that you have a convex function. And that ball is not symmetric, unlike the Gaussian. That will be a ball that will be maybe um, like this. But still, it has a unique minimum, and we can compute it. If we follow the, uh, if you use Newton's method, we can attain the optimum in this problem. So logistic regression is still considered a fairly easy problem um, to solve. Um, in the particular case when we implement Newton's method, um, which is what I'm showing you here, so that was the expression of the Hessian and gradient from the previous um, uh, slide. And if you substitute those in the estimate for theta, and do some simplifications to get something that's a bit more computationally efficient, you get an algorithm that actually has a name. It, it, people also call this the IRLS, or iteratively reweighted least squares. Because the expression looks like a least squares expression, um, except that it has this weight given by that matrix S. Okay. But it's essentially Newton's method. Well, it is Newton's method. And um, I will, I've already uploaded uh, the slides for you on the course website. And I've included the actual code, which tells you how to get the logistic function and how to run IRLS. And as you can see, implementing this is actually fairly easy. That's Newton's method for doing logistic regression. And then the main function is just load the data, estimate, and then you just need to call Newton's method to give you a new theta. And then you evaluate the training error rate and the test error rate. Okay, so it turns out to be, um, um, it turns out to be fairly easy to implement logistic regression. Okay, so, but now that we know logistic regression, let's move on to a, a more interesting problem. Not, go ahead. How does that um, compare to make base in terms of classification? Let's go with classification. There's, so there's the competition for the course, right? So the question is, how does this compare to naive base? And there's a competition. Okay. Beautiful place to test it. Okay, so I've described to you a binary logistic regression, but indeed you can do multiple linear regression, so more than one class. So you can do K classes as well, just like naive base. I will explain it in the context of neural networks in a few minutes. But yes, that's a good question. Is there a reason to go with the sigmoidal function? Pardon? Is there a reason to go with the sigmoid function rather than any other function? Which right. Um, you could choose other functions. So the, the sigmoid function is sort of comes in, um, for, well it comes in from different reasons. So one is from the neural network's perspective is historical. Um, there was this idea of having an activation function that is that it's not where the neuron is not active and after a certain threshold the neuron becomes active at one. 
And then when they tried to code those models, and uh, this was Jeff Hinton told me this once um, over dinner. So they didn't know how, they couldn't differentiate a step. So what they did was they just fit a curve, right? So the sigmoid. Um, but then there's also, if you do uh, technique in machine learning, which I didn't cover, a linear discriminant, pardon? Is it because of exponential family distribution? That is true. All, all these distributions we're looking at are part of the exponential family. Um, but the, I mean, that's just sort of a general factor statement. Because um, the, the, the more specific, the more to the point answer would be that if you, take, if you have two Gaussian points are distributed according to two multivariate Gaussians, and you to try to um, discriminate between the two, then you will find that the optimal boundary is given by the logistic function. So that's one derivation that I often do in 540. I've done it in 340, but I'm not doing it this year. So this is statistical reason. It optimally separates two Gaussian clusters. Is there a time limit on when you guys are running out of tests? Are you, what is, like, are you going to cut it off at a certain point in terms of uh, given the output? Oh, sorry, I didn't hear you. In terms of uh, given the, do we just give you the parameters and then you load them and you calculate the predictions? Or do you also see how long it takes us to learn? Oh, are you for the competition? Oh, how long does it take? Uh, we've been very lenient on that, provided that it doesn't take longer than whatever the TA said is the minimum time this year. I think we made it half an hour last year. Anything that runs for longer than that is out, because we don't want crazy. Or anything that brings crash to the computer is also out. Logistic regression works for that data set. Um, another thing that I didn't mention is, uh, I'll mention this in the context of neural networks, because neural nets are essential generalization of logistic regression, that um, just like we added regularizers for linear regression, all those arguments still apply here. We can put regularizers on theta, and we can put an L2 regularizer and an L1 regularizer. And logistic regression with an L1 regularizer is one of the most widely used techniques for binary classification out there. Okay, so it's used like in places like competitions like Kaggle all the time. No, no. All right. For okay. binary data though, is the L1 norm and the L2 norm equivalent? Like the absolute value of one is one and the square of one is one. For you, let me come back to, I'm going to go over one slide in regularization. Okay. The regularization is on the parameters, not on the y's. Right. I don't know if I understood your question. Um, like the, maybe I'll think about it and get back to you. Okay. Uh, I, I do have a slide covering it. Okay. Oh, right. Yeah, you're right. I'm confused. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> um, Neural networks. This is your first neural network. It's logistic regression. It's one year. You have an input, xi. It gets weighted by theta 2. It, you add to it theta 1, and that gives you u. So in other words, your u is going to be equal to theta 1 plus xi times theta 2. And then we put it through a sigmoid function, and we get y i equal 1 over 1 plus e to the minus u i, which is 1 over 1 plus e to the minus theta 1 minus x i theta 2. Okay. Now, the data here is just as before. So we have x's, and then we have y, 0 0.6, I don't know, 1, 0 0.8. And then, importantly, the y's are binary. I'm using only one x, but obviously this could work if I had more x's. 
if I had more x's, I would just have another x pointing. So I would have xi1, and I could have xi2, and then I would have had another parameter here. I'm not using this, but it's clear that I could have many inputs going in. And so I could have more x columns. Um, and, and this is the probability of y being equal to 1 given the input xi and the current setting of the parameters theta. So the probability of yi being equal to 1 given xi and theta is then just a Bernoulli distribution with success probability yi with the hat. which is essentially, as we know, is just saying that the probability will be yi when yi equal to 1 and it will be equal to 1 minus yi hat when yi is equal to 0. So it's just a quick way of summarizing those two facts. And now if we have n independent observations, n Bernoulli observations the probability of y1 to n given x1 to n comma theta which is just the probability of the vector y given the matrix x and the vector theta is just equal to the product from i equal 1 to n of p of yi given xi comma theta. Okay, so each variable is distributed according to a Bernoulli distribution, so it's one single coin, and then if you have n coins, you just multiply the probabilities. Right, so that's a single neuron, and as we move to more neurons, so now we start getting an interesting, a more interesting recursive um, architecture, where we will have an xi um, so we will have intermediate inputs um, u1 is going to be equal to theta1 plus theta2 xi and then we will have u12 which is equal to um, theta4 plus theta3 xi and then we will also have to squash them through sigmoids. So think of this now as three neurons. And we have two, um, two neurons. So you have a signal X, it splits into two neurons, and then it converges to one neuron again at the output. And so the first output of the first neuron is just equal to 1 over 1 plus e to the minus u11 which is um, given on the expression on the left oh somehow I, I misdrew that Then at, for the next neuron, whoops, for the next neuron we have u to 1 is equal to theta 5 plus theta 6 times 011 and then theta <coughs> 7 times 012 
and finally we squash it in order to make the prediction. So in order to get a prediction, we applying a bunch of uh, operations to the input. And so the <coughs> probability of yi given xi and theta is still modeled with a Bernoulli distribution. So nothing has changed in that respect because we still have binary data. The only thing that has changed is that the success probability, why I had, is now given by a much more complex function. Now the question to you is, why do I bother making the function more complex? Because it's it's not the data might not be linear. Exactly. Because initially my boundary was linear, but now by using several sigmoids, I can actually have a nonlinear function, right? Because 